you're really no longer an architect, an engineer, or a contractor when you start your own business. Business of Architecture, episode 333. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building a profitable and impactful architecture practice, a practice that lets you do your best work more often. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture step-by-step business training program for architects that shows you how to structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down with the complexity of running a business. Build the business you need to do the work that you want. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. My guest today is Matthew Gullo. Matthew Gullo is a native Houstonian and graduated from Texas A&M University with a degree in architecture. After 14 years into an architecture career as a licensed architect, he found himself as a principal of a multi-office Texas-based firm with a need for a change. In 2013, after being married for almost two years to his supportive and beautiful wife, he felt like his back was against the wall career-wise. The market was on an uphill climb, but the Houston office of the firm he was with was experiencing some light workloads. With the mood in the office waning, a strong desire to see what he could do on his own, and a lot of deep questions on his mind, he started writing and publishing his thoughts on a blog called Smart Simple Life. He was exploring ideas, coaching, self-development, business acumen, and alternatives to the traditional architecture career. To put it bluntly, Matthew was motivated to make a bigger change than just going to another firm, and he didn't want to be dependent on someone else to bring work into the office. So in December of 2013, he put in his notice to leave his principal position after having lunch with his great friend, Chris Griffazzi. That was at the time, and is still a part of, Keller Williams Real Estate. They talked about how the Smart Simple Life blog worked, his insights about it, and how a lot of the things that he was writing about paralleled Keller Williams' teachings and philosophies. With a cheat sheet to getting a real estate license that Chris gave him, Matthew devised a plan to become licensed in 14 days. That's a little bit less than an architectural career. Over the next 10 days, he got up (laughs) super early before work to study and complete all the required courses, took a two-day prep class, scheduled a test, and passed. In the last days of 2013, Matthew signed up with Keller Williams and took their extensive training called Ignite during the first week in January. With that training, the great people in his office, his coach, Sherry Malone, Chris, the support of his family and wife, he was able to sell 20 properties that first year, doing almost $4 million in volume and was named a rising star in real estate. In 2016, his wife was able to quit her job and began helping Matthew part-time. They also hired someone to help show property so he could focus on growing the company. Today, the Golo Group is in the top 1% of realtors in Houston. They have a full-time operations manager, an agent that focuses on buyers, a marketing department, and several partners that help them get it all done. Matthew, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Well, thank you for having me, man. I'm uh, very excited and honored to be here for sure. Um, I mean, me and you kind of go way back uh, on a certain level and and, uh, it's really just awesome to, to actually be doing this, so thank you. You know, it, it's true. Is it around that same time, 20, 2012, actually, when I started the same thing, an exploration on a blog of, of exploring alternative careers and, and looking at the business side of architecture in my case. And so we did connect back at that time, and we've kept in touch since then. It's It's been amazing to see what you've created now. So it's been, look, we're speaking right now in 2020. We're in the middle of this coronavirus quarantine pandemic. Uh, it's been going on eight years since 2013, which is when you left the full-time practice of architecture. Have you ever looked yeah. back? I haven't. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of thought I'm, I, I thought I might. Um, and I will tell you in the last maybe two or three years, it's for those first four or five, I, I really never looked back. Uh, for the first two years, I actually did some side uh, residential real estate projects. So I kept I sort of that first year and second year bridge the gap between architecture and real estate. So it was like 90% real estate and 10% architecture. Uh, Third year in, I said no more, completely cut ties with it. 
I really didn't want it to do. I didn't want to do it those first two years. I just did it for a financial uh, safety blanket, so to speak. Um, and after that third year, fourth year, fifth year, I never really even thought about it. When people would bring it up, I would, you know, no, no. It was. It's only here been maybe recently that I've actually thought about designing and building and developing maybe my own my own personal home and potentially one or two others. Um, I don't really miss the architecture world that much. If, if I missed anything about it, it would be the design and the space planning and really putting the materials together. But I don't want to go through the headaches of permitting and trying to read somebody else's mind to, to design what it is that they want. And, um, you know, the fact that one project takes a year or two years or three years. I mean, right now I get a client and within 45 days we're done. You know, there's a lot less time to disappoint somebody in 45 days and you could be a rock star. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Incredible. Now, it, it, I mean, let, let's face it. When you left our, the full-time practice of architecture, it wasn't like you were an intern. You, you weren't just some green guy with a couple of, you know, years underneath your belt. You'd gone through the ranks. You'd become licensed. A heavy investment in that in schooling, the licensing, went to Texas A&M. Let's face it, college isn't cheap. Uh, you had invested a lot of your life and your career into architecture, and you were even at the principal level of a firm. And I just, I just want to kind of get inside your mind of, of what was it that 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 allowed you or that prompted you to make that enormous leap of the safety and security of something you knew and really venture yeah. out into uncharted territory. Yeah, it was scary. Um, it sounds a lot scarier now that you that, you know that you say it that way, and I think about it that way, um, and. You, you start to think like, I don't know if I could, if I would be able to do that again. Um, at the time it wasn't quite as scary. Um, but just kind of going back, I, re I remember that very first job, you know, right out of school. So I was an intern, you know, I didn't have a license yet. Um, I actually still had to go through the intern development programs. I wasn't in, when I graduated, I was in that like weird space before you could graduate and go straight into taking your test. Um, and so I ended up having to graduate and do the IDP and all that mess. So it was like a three and a half year process just to knock out those eight or 900 credits. Then I remember uh, I was dating a girl at the time. I remember being at her house and just sitting on their back porch with her and her parents. And just, I was having like this real battle with what I was doing. It's like, there was a certain chunk of it that I love, but I was also, you know, Fre somewhat fresh out of school and sitting at a computer all day. It was just not working for me. Um, and I didn't know why or really how to express it other than just, you know, probably running my mouth and being a young 20 year old. And it, I'm sure it sounded terrible to her parents. But if you fast forward through those 14 years, I don't think that that ever really went away. And I don't know that I could ever explain it. And I don't think I was being very honest with myself. Um, and I have an extreme drive to be successful. So I just kept pushing up the ranks, pushing up the ranks, pushing up the ranks. Um, and I had some strategy behind becoming a principal that early um, in life, too, because I wasn't even 40 when I was named principal. I think I was 32. Um, yeah, 31 or 32. So it was very early to be a principal of a firm. Um, and so I stayed in the smaller mid range firms. I never went to a firm where I would be, you know, one of 100 or one of two or 300. Um, so that it, part of it was strategy. The other part of it was just an extreme drive to be the best, um, to learn more, to be a little bit more well-rounded and not just be a designer or just be a CA guy. And, you know, to have like a broader range to be very, really, you know, really good at speaking with people. I took classes, um, you know, I took classes on public speaking outside of work and things like that so that I could start to go to presentations. So I really just made this big, huge push to become the best I could early on, sort of knowing at some point I wanted to have my own firm. Um, so I, some of it is, you know, most people probably don't get to a principal level in those 13 or 14 years of their career. Um, but I basically got there and I just didn't like what I saw, you know, I mean, the money wasn't there, to be honest. I mean, not that you work just for money, but the money wasn't that great. Um, you know, um, the firm that I worked for, there were three partners and then there was, uh, 
maybe a handful of principals and then everybody else from there was the project architect or project manager and and down the line and we had some ca people um and so i was like i don't know if i really want to own a firm after seeing you know how things work um, that particular office was in the um, education space and it, you know, if, if a bond didn't pass or if you didn't get the bond work, there really wasn't anything else to work on. We weren't doing, you know, bond work for schools and education and fire stations or, you know, there was there wasn't another account. And I thought, man, it's it's amazing when a bond passes because you have tons of work for years and then eventually it just dries up. And so I just didn't. I just was not feeling great about it. And then I, I had worked for two other firms prior to that. And I saw a lot of the same, the same things in those firms. Um, you know, in 14 years, I, we had gone through, you know, at least three or four downturns. Um, and so I kind of look back at the market in those 14 years and say, okay, well, was it the market's fault or was it the office's fault? A few of them were the market. You know, I think everybody was just down. And then some of them were just the people that I worked for were not out hunting for work. They would get a, they would get work and they would basically sit there and work on that work and not look at getting more work. And I think that that is the downfall of any business. When you're busy, you need to get busier. Um, and I think a lot of us, m myself included, I have to be careful with that. When I'm busy, I tend to not, maybe not want to do more. Uh, and you have to, you, that's the time to lay on the gas and grow and expand um, and, you know, create a life for other people. And I just never saw that at, at a single architectural firm. And so I became very disillusioned once I got to that principal level. I'm like, this, this is really it. I'm not going to, I'm not learning anything here. You know, nobody's teaching me. It's like, oh, you're a principal, you know, everything. And I'm like, I don't, I'm 32 and I've only been doing this for 14 years. Somebody teach me. I'm like wanting to soak up knowledge and I wasn't getting it. And so I think at that point it was just like, I can't, I can't continue doing this. And so I had a lot of these conversations with my wife. Um, we hadn't been married that long, um, but she it, she's kind of a, a go-getter type A personality. You know, you can complain about it once or twice, and then after that, you need to do something about it or shut up. Um, and I had talked to my parents. You know, they're a little bit more uh, more relaxed and comforting, right? Because they're your parents. Um, and it just it's just we didn't have kids. I had a little bit of savings. Um, our bills weren't super high and, you know, it was dual income and, and she was just like, you just need to go for it. And oh, by the way, I'm quitting my job or I'm going part time and I'm going to work two days a week and go back to school. So literally in the same week I quit my job. So no more income. And she was down to two days a week going back to going back to school. So it was, it was a big, huge decision. I, I don't know if I can really speak to how we did that, but we just, I think we felt confident in ourselves. I think we felt confident with what was going on in, in the world at the time. Um, and I just knew that if I could get to a principal at 13 or 14 years, um, I think it was, I, I had been a principal for a year and a half or two before I quit. If I can get to a principal that quick, someone else will hire me in architecture. So if I really stink at being a real estate agent, I can always go back like I knew I was good at architecture and somebody would hire me and pay me something. It may not be as good. I may not go back into being a principal, but I could go somewhere and make at least 50 or $60,000 and sustain my family until I figured out what was next or jump to another higher position somewhere else. And I, I think that all those things lined up, my wife pushing me out of the nest, my people in my life being supportive, um, having a time, a little bit of savings, you know, I mean, it wasn't enough to sit there and live for an entire year to figure it out, but it, um, and I, I did get one or two small architecture jobs that were bringing in three or $4,000, you know, so I was kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna, after taxes and, and some expenses on the architecture side, I'll have five or six, $7,000 to help me in that first two or three months while I figure this out. Um, and so we just, we just leapt, just jumped off the cliff and and ran into it. Um, and I knew too that, you know, I may not get this chance again because at some point we were going to have kids and expenses were going to grow and it just, it, it, it can still be done during those times, but it's just more difficult. And I think it's more challenging mentally. Um, so there was a lot of things that lined up. Um, 
and I just said, the heck with it. Let's just go for it. You know, worst case scenario, we don't have any income for six months and I go back and work for somebody. And hopefully I, I work for somebody that will actually teach me more about the business. So you signed up with Keller Williams and for our listeners, Keller Williams is last time I checked the largest real estate company in the world. And, uh, at the same time, Keller Williams also has an incredible internal training program. I mean, even so much so that I, I wanted to reach out to some of the local agents here and see if I can uh, sneak in on some of their, their internal training meetings, meaning they train their agents very, very well, like next level, next level training. What I'd like to ask you, Matthew, is if for those who aren't familiar with real estate, it's, it's nothing to sneeze at that you've been able to be in the top 1% of realtors in Houston. I mean, we know that, look, you, you got licensed in 14 days. So if people think that there's a lot of architects around, I mean, think about the real estate. Like anyone who has a free week, two weeks on their hands can become a licensed agent. And now they're out there selling homes, right? So there's yeah. probably even less differentiation. What, what do you think have been really the keys to you having the success that you've had in the real estate world? I will say that the, the training here is like you said, it's just, it's bar none. And it's not just training on how to be a realtor. It's training on what does your mindset look like? How are you operating your day? What time do it, down to how do you get, when do you wake up in the morning? Um, you know, what are you eating? They, they really dive into, uh, you know, how you run your life and how you live as a human and really try to upgrade you as a person. And I think through all those things, and, and when I was writing The Smart Simple Life, I was looking for all those things. I was trying to figure out how do I become better? How do I become a better husband? How do I become a better future father? How can I be better to my parents, the, the people around me? Um, you know, and this wasn't from an egotistical way of wanting to be the best. It was really more about you know, I think you, what's the point of being on the earth if you're not trying to go to the next level for yourself and then rub off on all the people around you and create a positive influence for others. And so, I, you know, really through all that, I just really started to open up and expand my mind and really realize the possibilities. Um, and then I knew that the game, the only game that I was playing is how many negative thoughts how many um, limiting beliefs could I move out of the way in my own head to become the person that I dream and think about, right? Um, I don't want to live a beautiful life in my head. I want to live it for real. And the only way to do that is to remove limiting belief, stop beating yourself up, um, stop thinking that you can't do it. Um, and I still use all of those things today because I still have fears. I still have shortcomings. And I, I think it's a never ending thing until you're 90 or hundred and you slide into to home. Um, you're constantly upgrading your life so that you can be better. You can be better for your kids and your family. So that was the foundation. So from there I started learning these things. The other thing is, is I came into that ignite training and I think a lot of people come in and they try to tailor things to, to what they like to do or what they're already comfortable doing. And you can't be successful being comfortable all the time. You got to get out of that zone. So I went in there I, and I just listened and they told me to do, you know, send a letter to every single person, you know, um, start doing open houses like you, you've never done them before. And so I put on a suit, you know, I, I was cl clean cut and groomed and I just went out there and did exactly what I was told to do. I didn't, I wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel. I was following the model. Um, and I worked, you know, eight days a week <laughs> uh, and I just grinded it out for an entire two years to really build a name, build a brand. And I, and I look, I came to Keller Williams to get an outline on what to do and to learn some more of these mental skills. And, and it worked. The other part of that is, is I just have an, I just have a really intense drive to be good, to be the best, to see how good I can do, right? I'm, I'm, how far can I get? How, how far can Matthew Gillow get in life? Not just from a financial standpoint, but how far can I go? And so with that attitude and that mindset paired with the training and just listening, actually listening to what they told you to do and doing it, most people don't. 
uh, it, it allowed me to, you know, sell 20 homes that first year um, and, you know, be honored for it. I mean, that's amazing. And to, to give our audience some, some context here, an average agent, how many homes a month might they sell? Seven. I mean, uh, that's a year. Yeah. So a month. Yeah. A month. Yeah. I mean, it's like 0 0.01, 0 0.02. Yeah. It's very, very low. So you, you were hitting almost, you were hitting almost two, two houses a month. Yeah. In I mean, fact, sounds... so in, in January, when I started, I sold zero, right? Um, in February, I sold one. Um, in, in March, I sold three. And then in April, I sold six. Wow. And I was a solo agent and I was so busy. I couldn't do, I couldn't do a whole lot other than service those six people. Um, and so in May it went back down to zero and then I, and then I ramped back up again and had a really, really good end of the year and an amazing December. And that's kind of how it went. It was this roller coaster because I couldn't keep pressing on the gas when I got the six deals and I didn't know what I was doing that much, you know? Um, but thankfully with the support of Keller Williams and the team that I had here, you know, they weren't on my team or people I hired, but some of the staff here, I was able to pull that off. So. What would you say would be the, the main differences in mindset and who you were being when you were an architect versus how you've grown and what, who you need to be today to deliver what you're doing? Mm. That's a fantastic question. Um, I would say, honestly, when I was an architect, I could probably get away with being a little bit more lazy because I was working for someone else and I was sitting behind a computer a lot of the time, um, you know, or I could put, I could maybe put something off until the next day or the, or over the weekend. And I can't do that anymore. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of putting things off. You ha if you're going to, if you want some free time or free space, you've got to hire people and create leverage in your life so that they can help you do those things because you can't ever really do it all. Um, and so I would, I would say that's the biggest difference is I can't, you can't put it down. Um, and that's tough, you know, not, not being able to rest um, or completely feel like I can stop is very difficult, especially those first three or three or four years when you don't know where your next deal is going to come from. I would say after seven years, I have a little bit more confidence and comfort level that somebody's going to call me for real estate needs. Now, if I don't stay on the pedal and continue to reach out to people and stay in touch with my community, that it's going to go way down. You have to always be on the gas. And so that's the major difference is that even though I was a principal of a firm, um, there was still other people there. There was other support that you know, I didn't hire and put in place. Right. Um, we had, we had assistants, we had staff, you know, we had a marketing department. Um, and I wasn't running all of that for all three firms. I was just running it for one. So I didn't have to, I could be really, really good, but I didn't have to worry about it as much as it, if it was my own. If all three of those offices were mine and I was the CEO of that company, it's a lot, it's a lot different job. You're not really an architect, in my opinion, at that point. You're a business person and you need to know how to run a company. And so for me, I had to learn both. I had to understand how to do real estate, how to sell. Um, it's, selling's not easy and it's not that slimy sales ball you know, I've got a 0% credit card for you today kind of sales. Um, you really have to be, you ha really have to get in touch with people's emotional sides for selling a home because it's completely emotional. Everybody feels like it's money related and, and statistics driven and it's not, it's emotional and then it's backed up by all of those things. So you really have to be good at a lot of different things to be a solo um a solo agent or even a solo architectural business owner. Uh, you're, I think a lot of people, and this is not just architecture specific, it's across a lot of businesses, but I, you hear of a contractor or an engineer or an architect and they're really good at what they do. They're really good at what they do. But then they say, I'm going to go start my own business and they have no concept of what that really means. You're really no longer an architect, an engineer or a contractor when you start your own business. And so coming to KW, I learned, I knew, I, I knew that back in the architecture firm, either from reading or just kind of my own intuition. 
Um, and so I knew that coming here that you, I would really have to be that person. And so that's the major difference is that I'm in control. Now I have t some a team and some staff now, so it's not all me anymore. Um, but you ca I can't stop. I've got to feed other people's families too. So I'm feeding myself, the business, the business expenses, our own home and personal stuff, plus other people's families. And, and they rely on me, you know. If I quit doing things, then... Um, and start to become not profitable and I can't afford them, then I have to fire them. Whose fault is that? It's not theirs. That's not what they were hired to do. So, You mentioned false beliefs, limiting beliefs, mindsets. What have been, looking back, what have been the main false beliefs and mindsets that you've had to change to really succeed where you're at right now from based upon when you were an architect? And another, another, another great question. Uh, you know, I think just the fear of not being able to do it, you know, you know, qu quitting a, a nice career, you know, I was making a decent amount of money. I think, uh, you know, a hundred, 105, 110,000 as a principal, um, you know, plus bonuses and, and having a four on, or four, uh, they, they did a SEP. So I, I had, you know, some savings put it, put, uh, into those accounts by the company and then I could put more in if I wanted to, you know, so, I mean, it was, it was a fairly comfortable deal. Um, and just, you know, leaving that, uh, th there was a lot of fear around that. It's like, I feel like I really can do better than that, but I don't know. Um, so I think there's still, you know, every day I wake up with a little bit of fear, like, you know, are you going to, are you going to be better than you were last year? Um, can you keep it going? Yeah, we had a fantastic April, but how, you know, is May and June and July, are they going to be good? Or are they going to be zero? And then, you know, what you did in May or earlier in the year, hopefully you save some money because now you've got to pay for four months of personal expenses, expenses for your staff. So, you know, I think there's always a little bit of a fear of, can you do it? Um, uh, I think some of the things right now are, a lot of times you'll get to ceilings. Um, so when I got to about six million and you know two hundred or two hundred fifty thousand in revenue, um, I was kind of like, how am I going to get to three hundred or four hundred? I don't know what I need to do to get out of my own way, and then what systems or models or do I need to hire somebody? So sometimes you know, even though there's a lot of training and there's a lot of uh, really great people around here that I can bounce ideas off of and you know, I have relationships with people like you that, that are thinking this way. Sometimes you feel alone um, and you just don't know who to ask or who to turn to, or those people just like, they don't know exactly how to help you. They don't live in your brain. Um, so I think a lot of that is just can be very limiting uh, and can be very lonely. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things, you know, just fears. I think exposure, you know, um, being vulnerable and putting yourself on video, putting yourself on social media, uh, you know, putting some of the things that you think out there and wondering if people will like it or if they'll be turned off, you know. Um, what if you put the wrong things out there? Or you say the wrong things. It could really damage your business. So, but you still want to be yourself. You want to be authentic because that's what, what attracts people to you. So, you know, I think the fear of of building your tribe. Who is your tribe? Are you okay with losing some of the people that you think should be in your tribe that maybe won't like you after you say a certain thing? That's really, that's something that's really popping up for us right now uh, as we get more into video and social media and, and me speaking my voice. Um, another thing is I started writing a book uh, a while back and, and have kind of stopped a little bit because I'm just afraid that nobody's going to want to read it or it's just dumb or, you know, I, I it's, it's just, the, I, I think a lot of it's just fear. Maybe just that's, that's it in general. There's just a lot of fears that come up and you have to be strong enough to get rid of them and strong enough to know that you're worrying about stuff that truthfully probably doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, you know, so true. I mean, so true for those who are business owners, they, they, they probably identify with that idea of fear. If you're still in a comfortable job, you may not really understand what it's like to be out on your own and just to realize that you, you eat what you kill and that nothing yeah. is guaranteed for tomorrow. 
You know, oftentimes I've thought, Matthew, that almost in, in, in an employee environment where I'm an employee, that employees, looking back to when I was employed, uh, that it's almost a false sense of security, it seems. Because when you look at it, what employee is truly completely provided for, right? You could get hit by a car tomorrow, um, your house could burn down, uh, you could get fired or laid off. And so it's, it's interesting that, you know, that we talk about fear being the, uh, the imagined worst case scenario, right? But it's almost as if being yeah. an entrepreneur, being a business owner, kind of really exposes you to that very frontally, very, very rawly in a very real, real manner. And it's difficult to deal with. How do you, how do you deal with it? What tools, what techniques? I mean, I'm sure Keller Williams is a lot about the mindset. What have you found to be powerful for you to overcome that fear? Because let's face it, that's something that would stop a lot of people in humanity from moving forward is just getting paralyzed by the, by the fear, by the, the worry and not showing up as the best selves. Yeah. No, I, I mean, you're a hundred percent right. I think, I think that that stops most people from, from changing careers or going from an architecture architect working for somebody to starting their own firm. Um, I think, I think you've got to have a couple people or, or some really good resources in your corner to lean on. You know, I think everybody wants to be a part of a tribe on some level. And I think if you can build that tribe, even if not, a lot of people say, oh, well, I need a mentor. Like Enoch has to be my mentor and I have to be able to call him and dialogue him with him every day. But if there's somebody that's already engaged in your world, they listen to your podcast, they, they read your articles, you are a mentor to them already, even if you don't know each other. And so having those guides and those resources, they give you fuel and they give you a leg to stand on and a foundation. Read, you know, reading different types of books, connecting with people. I think if you feel like you have a network and people you can lean on and ask questions for, it just starts to make it easier. And you realize that it's not just you. You don't have to do everything. Um, now you're going to have to do the work because your mentors aren't going to do the work for you, but they will ask questions and hold you up, you know, um, up to a certain level. And so, you know, being here at Keller Williams, there's a lot of really great agents and people that I can ask questions. So if I get down in the dumps or if I get frustrated with something or if I'm having a difficult situ situation with a client or, you know, I'm just kind of having a brain freeze on what I need to do to generate new leads, I can go get a refresher somewhere around here or with somebody. So I think having that network is just really key. And that and I think remembering, too, that they don't have to be somebody that you know personally that you have to call on the phone, but you can go back and look at their material and find the answer. Um, I have a coach. You know, I pay a lot of money every year to actually have a coach. So I can ask at once a week, I can ask questions. And if I don't have any questions, we can just have a talk or a dialogue. And I know that he's there, you know, helping me stay in place. I mean, what great athlete, what what great business person or CEO doesn't have a coach or a mentor? Um, you know, somebody, everybody has something. You have church, you have a mentor, you have a, a parent. Somebody has somebody in their corner. You're never alone. And I think if you just realize that, um, it makes it all of, the, all of that much easier to just be on your own um, and fight the fight, right? I mean, every day it's a fight. You got I have to get up and I have to get new leads and new listings and new buyers. Otherwise everything will come to a screeching halt immediately. Last month was amazing, but it doesn't matter anymore. Incredible. Now looking back, what, what insights would you have about if you were to go back and, and do an architecture firm now or run an architecture firm, how would you approach it differently? What would you focus on? What new knowledge or skills yeah. would you bring to that endeavor? First and foremost is clients. I I would be uh, I would be very business focused. I would set it up like a business. I would set up what, what what we call models and systems. And so what that means is is that if a if a, if I'm an architect and I ha and I'm doing homes. Um, or I have a segment of my business that does homes, we know exactly what we do and we do it the same every single time. Now the home doesn't look the same every time, but we treat the clients the same. They come in and they do the exact same, um, you know, seven step process with us as far as like, what is it that you want and making them build a portfolio so that we can get into inside of their heads and I can shortcut that process with them and make more money. So I would be very focused on time, 
because let's face it, doing an architecture project takes a ton of time and it sounds so good when you get a brand new home and they're going to pay you 20 grand or a hundred grand for this house. And you're like, Whoa, I just got a huge commission. But then you realize it's going to take you eight, 10, 12 months. And that's nothing. You might as well go to Kroger and stack groceries. So I would, I would figure out processes that shortcut the time that I had to spend with that client and make sure that they're getting a really good product and that they give me referrals. And my job as a business owner, first and foremost, would be getting clients, hiring the right people. It's You're better to hire an amazing architect and give them $100,000, even if it's even if they're supposed to be paid 60 per the industry, because he or she will do eight times the work and make you look eight times better for 40 grand versus hiring three people at 60 that that aren't that great. And I like to be lean and mean. Um, so I would rather be five, six, seven people and do the same work that the team across the street's doing with 30 people. And they have a, a gazillion bills and they're inefficient and they're heavy um, and their people aren't that great. And that's that's exactly how I would start an architecture firm. I would go out and get so much work that I was stressed out and I couldn't do it all. And then I would hire the right people and I would have I would already have a book or a procedure lined up for how we're going to do business. What do you see as the key to hiring good people? A process, going through classes on how to hire people. Most people, you're not taught that in school, and it's a skill. Hiring people is a skill. Um, and so I would find resources and try to really understand and, and, again, develop a process on how to hire people. At, here at Keller Williams, they, they ha we have a process. And uh, whenever I hire an employee, they – they get a disc profile test and then they also get what's called a KPA. And that basically goes through and finds out what skills they have. And then it, it gauges them with all the different, with all the different roles that we have for a real estate person, you know, admin marketing, are they good at buyer's agent? Are they going to be good at sales? Are they good on the headset and they can call a million people a day. And so I'm, I'm basically figuring out their personality um, I sit down and have four or five discussions with them. I call, I ask for three references. I get those three references and I talk to all three of them. But then when I'm talking to them, I say, who's another person that you know that I can call that knows this, this person. And I go three layers deep. So I want to talk to at least nine people from those three um, or six more from those three. So eventually I've, I've spoken to about nine people or sometimes even 10 or 12. So I really get to understand this person. Um, I've even developed weird things like I want to see your car. Um, I don't come out and say, hey, I, I'm a creepster. I want to see your car. But I try to figure out a way to see their vehicle. Is it clean? Is it nice? Is it dinged up? If you're an architect, you better you want somebody who's going to be a C personality most of the time, unless they're going to be on the business development side, then you want a high I. And so I studied personalities. Um, and so there's a process behind hiring. You, you can't just graduate from college, go work in an architecture firm for three years, get a little bit of experience, and then all of a sudden create a firm and kill it. I mean, mo some people might, but typically not. And so you've got to source out the skills to understand how to hire people. And I think it's an ongoing practice. I don't think that you take the class one time and you're an ace in the hole. I think you screw it up a lot, um, you know. And and you're the owner, and you need to you need to know that there's going to be fear. People are going to quit on you. That's scary, is when everything's churning and burning, and you're feeling good, and you're busy, and someone comes to you and says, "Hey, I, I'm I'm leaving," and then you go into a complete tailspin because you don't know how to hire very well, and you haven't positioned yourself to say, "Okay, that's." That's that hurts. That stings. But I can fix this. Um, and I've been in. I've been in. I'm speaking. You know, I've been in all those places because of having to hire and having to learn. And I still haven't mastered it. Um, but I'm way better at it now. And I know way more than I ever would have had I just jumped straight from architecture to doing an architectural firm and not come to KW and learned a lot of the things that I've learned. Amazing. And that's really why I can't. Yeah. That's why I came to Keller Williams was to learn that stuff uh, more yeah. than to be a realtor or to sell homes.
Yeah. What would you What would you say would be some of the key insights that you've gained in terms of the business aspect? Obviously, you mentioned lead generation, client acquisition being huge. The emphasis on that. Any other key business lessons that have been aha moments? You mentioned hiring as being extremely important. Talking about the the the, the models and processes. Anything else that comes to mind as kind of top shelf? Well, in our world, we call it leads, listings, and leverage. So leads, right, is business or client acquisition. Uh, listings for us is because, uh, you know, a sale of the home is less time intensive on a daily basis than a buyer. So I could probably list 50 homes with maybe three or four staff members, but I would never be able to help 50 buyers with three or four staff members. And the money is the same. And so knowing, knowing where your profit center is and what's most profitable for you. So if you have an architecture firm and you do say three, you have three different types of projects that you do, which one makes the most profit for you? Which one's the fastest, the easiest? And I think you need to have that on, on a churn and burn wheel. Um, and then you, everybody, every architect wants to do fun and cool projects. And maybe those are the other two that, um, that build your name, build your brand, build your reputation, but maybe they're not quite as profitable or they take longer. Um, and then leverage is people. Uh, you cannot do everything alone. There's it's, I think it's really difficult to be a solo architect, um, and try to do the books and run the business and get new work and actually sit down at the computer and draw and design and create a really good project doesn't happen you need staff and so in order to hire staff you've got to have money so you have to figure out what's most important outside of that it's going to be mindset i think that fourth key on top of that is what's in here between those two ears and how strong you are and how strong that you continue to mentally build yourself that's it. It's really simple. I think if we make it complicated, which 95% of the time we do, and I, I'm, I'm included in that, um, you know, I think that's what makes it really, really difficult. Love it. Listing, leads, and leverage. I mean, as simple yeah. as that. And then mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yep. Well, Matthew, thank you for joining us today on the Business of Architecture podcast. Matt, it's, first of all, it's been amazing catching up with you after all these years. Yeah. And um, Super awesome. Yeah, it's remarkable the success you've had. Congratulations on doing what you're doing because I know that it's it's no small feat. Yeah, thank you. So for those of our listeners, you know, in, in this podcast we talked about we talked about models, we talked about processes. Hopefully, you're aware after listening for a while that Business of Architecture offers a program where you can come in and you can learn, save the time, take a shortcut, and learn the models and processes that work for running an efficient, profitable, impactful architecture firm. You can find out more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. I would highly recommend that. <laughs> Shortcut the process and find somebody who, who knows what they're doing and lean into them. And the money shouldn't be an object, really, because it's going to save you time, save you effort, and springboard you into action and where you really need to be. I love it. Love yeah, it. Thanks for having me. Matthew, so, so glad having you here. And that's a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.